Cool. Thanks, Andy. So, just a quick Sandy check. Um, I assume everyone can see my my screen. If you can't, just say something real quick, and and we'll try to sort it out. But um, what I will attempt to do today, um, and I know I've probably been told how much time I have. In fact, Andy, how much time do I have, real quick? I was thinking uh, 30, 35. Okay, cool. Um, what I'll, I'll do is I'll give a, a little background, a little context, uh, a couple slides here to do that, and then I'm going to jump right into the application itself. I'll, uh, I'll, just, I'll just move over to that, and I'll sort of kind of walk you guys through how the application works, um, just to give you an idea of, of how we developed this and like what our mindset was going into it. Two of the developers uh, from CLS America, I think, are on the call, too. Um, so if you guys, uh, it's Matthew and Lauren, if you guys have anything that you want to add, feel free to chime in. Uh, yeah, so I'll go ahead and move forward. So the tablet application itself, um, it's developed by CLS America, and Michael Kelly's on, and he can probably answer um, any questions you guys have specifically about CLS America, if you have any questions. Um, the application is called Thorium, um, and we started developing uh, probably back in around 2014, which was sort of the early stages of gathering specifications and requirements and trying to understand what it would mean for us to move our paper data collection into, into a tablet application, because um, it's not a direct translation, right? You can't just take a, a static paper form and then, and then make some sort of uh, of application where you're just punching in in data and expecting it to to be to augment the workflow and, and to be dynamic. So it was it was quite a process. Um, we did do some early testing and we had a lot of really good feedback. And then we decided to sort of um, re envision some of our thoughts and like really um, take it to the next level. And so right now uh, we've just started uh, recently a whole another um, series of beta testing and a much more robust series of beta testing. We're going to try to target about 36 trips over the course of 12 months um, in Hawaii, uh, both the deep set and the shallow set. Um, and then we're going to try to, uh, in, in theory, we're going to try to hit about 10% of all the observed trips of the year to try to get a nice number, uh, to a nice representative number of, of what it's like to really know um, if, if the, uh, well, I guess the purpose of the, of the beta testing is to really just make sure that we can improve the usefulness and the usability of the application so that when we do go to, um, when we do push this over into, into production, everything's sort of cleared up and we've kind of hit all the, all the things that could set us back. Um, testing itself is sort of broken into three cycles um, and essentially we're trying to mimic similar um, Similar development cycles, it's something you might see in Agile. It's not a, it's not a, direct, um, a direct copy of Agile. We sort of tweaked it in, in terms of you know, what our limitations are. Um, but essentially, we do some testing. We're going to try to do about 12 tests uh, in a cycle. And then there's some, there's some feedback gathering. And then we do um, a round of, of development. And then we push out a new version of the application. And then we do it all over again. And so essentially, we're going to do that three times over the course of the year. Um, yeah, and that's, that's pretty much the, the gist of it. Yeah, the beta testing, we're doing it for the kind of the following re reasons. We want to improve the quality of the system. We want to promote user acceptance, which is to say um, we want to make sure that it works for the observers and it works for all the program stakeholders. Um, we want to, and we want to fix issues now before we move into implementation. That's, that's really the, the gist of it. Um, yeah, and then the goals of the project overall, these have been the same goals, the same ones I, I reported on to you guys uh, a little over a year ago, is develop the application, um, make our data collection more timely and more accurate, and then um, one of the more abstract goals, of course, is to sort of like make the make program costs more efficient, you know, and, and we feel we'll achieve that by, uh, by getting, making sure we hit goals one and two, so. That's sort of the background. I know I'm going really fast. Did that? I hope everyone uh, consumed that. Um, let me know if you don't. If you have any questions, just chime in. Um, so I think I've probably showed this to you guys before too, although it was a little more abstract in the past. Now it's, it's pretty clear. This is generally how it works. The observers out at sea on a vessel, uh, they're collecting data on a tablet. The data is encrypted, and there's a whole story behind how 
how we came to the encryption and, and the specifications and requirements and navigating bureaucracy and all that, but the data is encrypted. Um, it's picked up by Iridium. It goes to the CLSA processing center. Um, we pick it up into our servers. We decrypt the data. It moves to the program staff for um, QA, QC, and then the data is made available to the end users. That's generally in a big snapshot how this works. Um, so the data is, it is a real-time um, data collection application. So the observer, and you'll see this when I demo the app, but the observers are collecting data in real time. They're sending it into the satellites. We're picking it up. We can review it, and then we can essentially make it available to end users. Um, the, logis the programmatic logistics of how this will work, how our debriefing processes will change and things like that, um, we're starting to untangle some of that now, but that's really the next big challenge is now that we know the technology works and that it's, it's um, becoming more useful and more usable for the users, how do we then change programmatically to fit this model uh, as opposed to observers collect data, um, they have this big stack of paperwork, they come in, the debriefers go through a, a number of times before it's made available to the end users. So it speeds things up quite a bit. It's, it's an interesting challenge. Um, so the application itself, here's a quick map. Um, I'm going to show this stuff to you guys so I won't spend too much time trying to untangle this, but essentially it starts from left and it goes right. Um, you start on a home screen when you open the application. Uh, you have a couple of features. Um, there's a settings, and there's um, there's some there's some dynamic things that show you if you're connected to the internet or to the Iridium satellites. It'll pull your GPS and your time. Uh, it'll even show you your vessel speed, things of that nature. Um, from there, you sort of have two modules you can break off into. There's an email module, um, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's like any other email module. There's an inbox. Uh, you can compose letters. Uh, you can see your sent emails. You can, there's an address book. I'm probably not going to go into that um, because of time, but it's just a, it's a pretty standard email module. In fact, we use this. I've been emailing. We have an observer at sea right now testing, and I've been emailing with him back and forth um, a couple times a day for the last few days. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty um, powerful the, to be able to talk to your observers in real time at sea while they're working. Um, which is pretty interesting. And then the other module from the home screen is, we're calling it PyreOp right now um, for you know Pacific Island Regional Observer Program, but essentially that's the sort of the internal application that gets to all our uh, electronic forms and how the observers collect data. Uh, from there you move into, before you, you get to the more dynamic forms, you have to essentially select a trip or set up a trip, and that's in the My Trips module. And then from there you move into a a dashboard, and inside the dashboard, it's sort of structured in a timeline format with these various tabs, uh, trip tab, gear, set, haul, pending tabs, and then, you know, and the idea of these tabs is depending on what you're doing at the time, what the observer's doing, um, are they setting, are they hauling, um, is this just trip level information that doesn't necessarily pertain to um, fishing effort, things like that. Depending on what the observer's doing, they'll be in one of those tabs to, to use the data. Um, and that's essentially how the application works. Uh, yeah, and the, the, big, the big piece to this too is the catch event log, which is where the observers spend most of their time. So I'll, I'll show that too, but you can see there, if, you're in a haul, if the observer is hauling gear in the recording catch, um, there's some interesting um, dynamic behavior that we set up for the observer to, to go into the catch event log and do that in a way that really mimics their workflow. Uh, it was a really challenging effort to, to figure out how to do this. And so I will show that to you guys. So, um, do I have anything else? No, not on this slideshow. Let me, let me see if I can load up the tablet. Um, I apologize, this is not a full screen version. I have not paid for the software, so I'm using the free version, which is just going to give us this snippet of the tablet. Um, so, and let me know if everyone can see this okay. Um, this does that. Hopefully it, it's not too blurry for you guys, or maybe it'll sort of slowly start to, to unpixel out like that. But um, this is essentially the home screen of the tablet. In fact, this is, it's any other standard Android application. So you turn on the turn on the tablet and it looks like any other Android tablet. The, the left hand, um, let's see if I use my mouth, this is the Thorium application right here. Um, and when you click on it, you come to a home screen and 
at the top here, you have some um, some information that's just that's just trying to um, get the attention of the user. So, if data were leaving the tablet or coming into the tablet, uh, these arrows would light up red. So, as data is leaving, this area would, arrow would light up red, and if it were coming in, this would would light up red. Um, I am connected to the internet. Um, I am pulling GPS. I think this is this is the device GPS is, is letting me know that, that it is currently on. I am not um, connected to Iridium, however, I am inside. So um, if I were connected to Iridium, then this data down here, the GPS, the time, um, the lat, the long, all those things would start to fill in because it would pull it from the, it would pull it from the, the satellites. Uh, I could, however, switch this application over to pull it from at least the parts that can from the, the device GPS, but I just have it set for satellite right now. Um, Matthew, Lauren, since you guys actually put all this together, if you have anything to add, go ahead and chime in. Um, settings is up here, and if you go into settings, you have a couple of different options. Um, most, a lot of this is for the debriefing staff and and whatnot, but, um, well, not necessarily, but I mean, user preferences is probably the most interesting. The observers can actually set up um, some different preferences for their data collection uh, that's sort of unique to them or like what they would like to see. Uh, and then that's sort of the home screen. So yeah, I'm not gonna go into detail, but if you wanted to send an email, you would do it, it this is how you would do it. And then this is how you compose an email. And then I could send an email to um, one of the debriefing staff or, or whomever I need to. Um, so that's email. Uh, the far more interesting aspects of this application are in the Pyre uh, module, which I'll go into now. One thing that's cool about this data that's being pulled right here, um, if I were outside and I were connected to a satellite, the time and the GPS would all get pulled into the application. So the observer doesn't have to stop what they're doing in their data collection, run into the wheelhouse and look up the GPS or pull out their handheld GPS and boot it up. Um, it's just really dynamic. Like whatever they're doing in real time, they can just pull whatever time and GPS they need that way. Um, so, clicking into so this is the My Trips module. Um, down here, you see a history of previous trips. Uh, LL just means long line. That's how we number our trips down here. So, uh, long line one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. Um, these were just things I was playing around with and testing. Uh, this is nice because if you're an observer, we don't always, sometimes observers will do multiple trips um, before coming into debris, particularly if they're, they're doing shallow sets out of California. So this way they could stack up their trips and um, archive them and then start a new one if they need to without having to come into the office. Um, you could click into this and, and see a, um, a, a summary of the data that you sent for that particular trip. I'm not gonna spend the time now but that is an option. Uh, so I'll go ahead and I'll start a new trip. Um, let's see, I'll just put my observer number. Uh, all observers have a four digit number that's unique to them. Um, trip number, we'll say, it's a, uh, we'll say it's a long line trip. We'll just call this three, four, five, six. Uh, and we'll say we're going deep setting and then starting the trip. Okay, success. So the observer uh, has now just started a new trip. Um, at this point, that data is being sent to us in satellites, so I now know that Joe is on trip LL whatever, and he is going on a deep set trip. And observers are being instructed to do this at the placement, uh, when they're being placed on the vessel. So we're getting a heads up. Um, and this immediately pulls you into the dashboard. Um, here's the timeline up here at the top uh, for sets. Um, and when I say sets, I mean like a, a day's worth of fishing effort. We call them sets, but it's a set and a haul. Um, and then here are the tabs. So uh, the, the tab that you, you sort of land on is, is the trip tab. And um, yeah, sorry, John Kelly keeps walking in and out of the room. He's distracting me. So the trip tab, and then um, if you wanted to begin a trip, um, you would simply click on begin a trip. And this is sort of how the application works. Um, most of the forms operate like this, so we'll pick a date and we'll just set it to today and right now and we'll say we're leaving Honolulu, um, we'll say the permit number, this is the permit number of the vessel, uh, we'll call it the Batman, the operator's name is Bruce 
Wayne. And here's a summary of the data that I just entered. Um, and then I could submit it. And it's gone. And so now the observer has just submitted that they've left on a trip. Um, I know the vessel, I know the time, I know the port that they left from, et cetera. Hopefully this will stop pixelating out. <clears throat> once you can see the screen, uh, once it uh, clears up here, what you'll notice too is that begin of trip form is now gone. Um, the, the behavior of the, of the application is such that when an observer sends a form, if it's a kind of a singular, singular form or kind of like a, a one-off form, then the application will sort of augment that process for the observer and actually remove it from the application. Uh, you can only begin a trip once, so the form is now gone. Um, and that is essentially what that's showing here. Um, and then there's some other sort of trip level forms. Uh, it's a little out of context for you guys because maybe most of you are familiar with how we collect data, but essentially these are the types of activities that an observer could be doing that are sort of um, trip level that aren't necessarily um, specific to a day's worth of, of effort. Um, we've, al we've also built in this uh, toolbar here, so if the observer uh, needs to access a calculator, um, a camera, build notes, or if they want to send a comment, uh, and the comment can pertain to any part of the data, um, and it's, so we'll say that the you know, they're sending a comment about the gear configuration of the vessel, and then if it's specific to a set, they could put that in there as well, and then they could write their comments, um, and, if, and then just basically, you know, do a little review here and submit it off. And now we'll get that comment back here, and we'll know, okay, there's some, you know, the observer's trying to tell us something about the gear configuration, et cetera. Um, the counter function is pretty cool, too. Um, Hopefully this clears up here quickly, and then I'll show you. But I'm clicking on the counter button, and you get this um, sort of dynamic little clicker function. Uh, and this is cool for us because we do a lot of um, we do a lot of tallying in our data collection. So I'm going to add a counter, and then I can um, start tallying things if I need to. I can um, I can rename this counter to whatever I want to, um, and I can also delete it. So. Um, yeah, so that's essentially, that's essentially the counter function. Um, so let me show you how, guys how the timeline works. Um, if the observer is going to start a set, they would go up to the timeline and they would hit this little plus. Um, and then they would, you know, you would get a little, little pop-up that says, do you want to start a new set? You create the set, and now you're in set one. So if the observer is in these tabs, in this portion of the timeline, um, for instance, the set, then, and they were like, let's say they were going to start the set, then we would know that that is set one because that's where they're at in the timeline. Um, so they pick a date, set their date, um, set their, their lat and their long, um, which the tablet will pull for them. If it's Beaufort, sea surface temp, 75, and then the weather is rain and fog. Okay, and then here's the begin of set information. Um, and then they can just simply submit it and it's gone. And just like the trip tab, because in set one you can only begin the set once, the form is now gone. So the observer couldn't accidentally send a form twice or, or make that mistake. It also gives them a little bit of a, uh, a, a to-do list. So they know in, when they're setting that they need to essentially um, get rid of these forms. Um, and we actually found that in some of the feedback we collected, the observers really like this. It's almost... Um, a lot of them are perfectionists and, and, and whatnot, so it, it feels good to sort of check things off the list. I know some of you probably feel that way too. Um, and so that's kind of what we've recreated here. Um, some things you need, that there just could be an, um, any number of incidences of. So behaviors could happen 15 times over the course of the set. So this will actually never disappear. And a behavior for us um, is just, it's, it's spe specific to a protected species behavior so it would be like a dolphin's bow riding or something, they would send in a form for behavior. Um, but that is essentially, essentially how this works. I know I'm going really fast. Um, Andy, stop me if I'm, if I'm uh, running over time and whatnot. Okay, do what you got to do. Yep. Um, okay, so that is essentially how the timeline works. Uh, there's also this really cool sidebar function that pops out so you can see you can get even more specific with your data and more dynamic. 
um, and we have this, this summary um, module here too. And the way this works is um, you can sort of see a summary of the trip um, and it's going to have all kinds of data for the observer to look at. Um, if they start racking up their, their catches on their catch event log, how many sets, how many forms have they sent, uh, things like that. They could break it down by their sets. So right now we're just looking at set one because that's all I've started. Uh, the number of hooks that were set for set one, the number of floats that were set, how many catches, some of the, some of the metadata uh, that helps observers stay organized, and then the forms. They can actually see, okay, what specific forms have I sent in? And then we've also had to figure out a way to, to update forms in case an observer makes a mistake or catches himself later, um, in which case they simply go to where the form is and they use this little update function down here at the bottom and they can change the data um, and send it to us. And then we can see, okay, the observer's updating this form. They, you know, it was, you know, the Beaufort was two, not five or whatever. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the purpose of this summary function. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's more or less how these aspects of the application work. Um, I, will, I will show you guys now. So here's the hauling tab. What was interesting about the hauling tab and was probably the biggest challenge about developing this application and probably still is the biggest challenge about developing this application is making a catch event log um, really usable for the observers. So when observers in a hauling function um, or in a hauling mode, I should say, and they're going to start, you know, the crew starts picking up, picking up the line and catch are coming in, they have to record all of those fish. Um, so they go into the catch event log, and again, without some of the context of how we collect data, some of this is, might not make any sense, but essentially they land on a page like this. And so this page is, is for, one, for one catch. Um, so they could go in and the observers, there are kind of two ways for the observer to record catch. Um, on the paper form, they have to actually put both. So they have to either... Um, they have to write the common name and then write the code of the fish. So in the application, we've tried to make this as dynamic as possible depending on the preference of the observer. So if the observer likes to write the name first, they could simply start writing in the name, um, we'll say Albacore, and then as they're writing in the name, the list gets shorter and shorter, and then they could say, okay, Albacore Tuna 215. Um, if they go codes, uh, if, they're, if, they're, if they've just been grandfathered in or if they've been observers for a long time or they know the codes, memorize them, they could simply just start writing in the code 215 and then they know, okay, Albacore Tuna, and then they select it. Um, so we've tried to recreate that, that process on paper but make it a little bit more dynamic. We'll say it's on float one, hook three, um, the condition was alive, um, it was kept, there's no damage to it. Um, every third fish in our data collection, the observers are required to sex the fish, so we'll say <clears throat> this was a male, and they're also required to take a measurement, so we'll say it's fork length, um, 25. That's a really small fish, let's say 50. Um, and then we'll say they took a photo and they took a specimen of it, so I'll, I'll select those as well. And there's no need for a comment. Um, so at this point, they've just recorded the first line of, ca of catch. But they're going to do this for the next 12 or 15 hours. So to make this usable, instead of them going and sending this form off right now and then having to go back into the catch event log to record another one, they can simply stay in swipe and now they're at another another line of catch just like that um, this screen is blue and this one is black letting the observer know okay this is the, this fish needs a sex and a measurement the blue screen the fish does not need a sex and a measurement um, and so every third screen will turn black just prompting the observer hey you need to you need to take a sex and you need to take a measurement so we'll record another one um, we'll say let's record a bird um, We'll say 681, black-footed albatross, float two, hook seven. Uh, we'll say it was dead and actually, you know what? We'll say it was injured and it was released injured, um, which is something that's only specific to protect species. Um, fish can't be injured, so it's just a protect species thing. Um, and so we'll move on and we'll add another. Um, say this was a 211 or big eye tuna, we'll say it was dead, or let me put in a float, put also float one, we'll go hook nine, it was dead, um, it was kept, we'll say it had marine mammal damage, and 
we'll move on. Okay, and now we're back to another black screen, which is just prompting the observer, hey, you have to take a sec, you have to take a measurement. So that's kind of the idea behind this. Uh, one thing that's cool about this too is the, the user interface will actually change based on how the observer is entering the data. So um, for instance, um, let me put in, let me put in a billfish, billfish, let me put in black marlin, there we go. Um, this is pretty cool. The, uh, if you guys look down at the measurement, we're now looking at an EF, which is eye to fork measurement, as opposed to an FL, which is a fork length. So if this were a tuna, um, and I hope this works, actually I haven't tested it, we'll see. Uh, if this were a big eye tuna, yeah, so it changes to FL. Because in our fishery, when you catch a billfish, you take an eye to fork, and when you catch a tuna, you take a fork length. That's just, so it, the, it's dynamic, it will actually change depending on how the user is entering the data. Um, so let's say the haul is over and the observer wants to send their catch record information. Um, there's a cool little summary function up here at the top. Um, if the observer clicks on the summary function, they actually get to see a running tally of everything that they've caught over the course of the trip. Uh, there's also some other um, data embedded in there. They can see that, okay, the, the first fish, the albacore tuna, there was a photo and a specimen. Um, the, the second line of catch was a protected species. It was a bird, so there's some some information that they're going to have to fill out um, in response to that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then what the observer will do, once they're certain that they want to s submit these forms, we'll check them off, and then they would go down here and they would hit the submit button. I can't hit the submit button right now because I have this, this line of catch that's not been filled in. Maybe the observer made a mistake and they added a, uh, an extra fish or a line that they shouldn't, so the user could simply just drag the line across and they could delete that record. And now I can submit the catch, which I'll do right now. And the data submitted. What, what's really interesting about this is the observer recorded some data in that catch that now populated the pending tab. As you guys can see here, there's a queue at the top of the tab, which means, hey, observer, um, you need, we need some more data about some of the things you caught during your haul. And so they could go in and they could see, okay, yeah, there was a bird and then there was a photo and there was a specimen. Um, so they could, they could go in and they could start to fill in some of this data. Um, and they'll be able to do this dynamically too. Like if, if it slows down in the hall, they could just pop out of the catch event log, go into this tab, fill out this data, and then go right back to where they left off in the catch event log. But um, so yeah, it was set one. Uh, yes, those are the things I selected. Let's see, it was this date and this time. Um, and do I want to add a specimen? Yes, I'll add a specimen. The specimen type was a gonad, and the collection purpose was uh, circular 66B. I don't need any comments. No, I do not want to add another one. Yes, I will add a photo. Here's my description of the photo. Um, yeah, let's just say uh, comments, and then I do not want to add another photo. Yes, this data looks good. Submit. And now that form is gone. So all that data was just uh, collected by the observer and, and submitted off. Um, and that's basically how the application works. Um, I know I went really fast um, for the sake of time. Um, if we go back to, um, let's see here, let's go to forms. And then actually, yeah, let me, let me go to the summary. So if we go to the summary and we look at this, you can see that like as the observer is setting this data off, there, it's, it'll be, these will start to turn green as the, as the data is sent through the satellites. I'm not connected to a satellite because I'm inside, so you're not going to see that feedback, but that's essential. It will let the observer know that, okay, your data is being sent. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much the application and how it works. Um, see here, if you're in the, in the trip summary, you can start to see now that we've started collecting cache that that information will start to build for the observer. So I can see, oh, there's a seabird. Um, these were the tunas that were caught, um, et cetera. So, um, and yeah, there's a little protected species, uh, you know, to let everyone know, like, hey, there's, this is important. You did, ca you did catch a protected species. There's a bunch of paperwork that goes along with that, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's the application. Uh, Andy, I think that's pretty much it um, in terms of giving you guys kind of a, a, an overview of how this works. I, I don't know if there's any questions, but I'd be, be willing to answer them if there were. Great, thanks, Josh. I, I got some questions. Um, this is Andy. 
First, yeah. though, um, I'm wondering, it looks like everything submits off or at least queues for submission. So Correct. can you walk me through that transmission process, what gets stored on the machine and what goes directly to you guys and is not available to the server, et cetera? Yeah, I'd say, actually, Matthew and Lauren could probably answer that better, but in general, if data is being submitted, it gets put into a little packet um, of information, and then once the, and yeah, it's queued to be sent. Uh, once the observer hits submit, by the way, they don't have to do anything else. They just simply have to, the tablet does the rest. It waits for the satellite, and then it starts sending those files. Those files sort of come in to us, and they get, um, they get put together in an interface that's specific to the debriefing staff. Um, it's a database, a database management system built on SQL Server. Um, it's called PyROPS. Uh, but that's essentially what happens there. Uh, Matthew, Lauren, do you guys, um, I don't know, can you answer that question better for Andy in terms of, of some of the specifics of that? Sure, Matthew speaking here. Uh, yeah, I mean, basically everything is transmitted in real time via satellite. So right now it's queued because Josh is probably inside a building and we don't have a, a clear view on the sky, but uh, along the side of collecting the data, when it's submitted, it would be queued, as we can see here. But like the little spinning weed, uh, within a couple of minutes, all of that would be clear with green check mark, which means that all the data would, would successfully be transmitted directly to Josh uh, team uh, on shore. Right, and so what the observer will see in terms of feedback too is this arrow, where this little data area is, they'll see this little arrow start to light up red. Uh, and that's just letting them know, like, hey, you know, you are transmitting data right now, so you're good to go. We also keep a hard copy of everything which is uh, collected directly on the device in case there is uh, an outage or anything goes wrong in terms of transmission. Uh, and as Josh briefly mentioned it at the beginning, all the data is encrypted when we send it. So uh, the data is secured and transmitted in real time uh, on the go alongside the, the collection of the data. Yeah, that's true. That, that's a good point. So yeah, the data is, all this data that's being sent is also still stored on the tablet. Um, so when the observer comes in, if something, if something goes wrong, if they're not transmitting in real time, it's kind of not really that big a deal uh, as long as everything else works because um, at the end of the day, uh, we can still access the history of the data. We can still pull all the data that was, was entered on the tablet um, and just ingest that into our database management system if we need to. And only the, uh, the program staff has access to actually delete files from the tablet at this point. So the observer couldn't go in and accidentally delete their data. They would, just, they, they would not have access to be able to do so. But do they have access like for editing if they need to edit, or is it, do they, you lock down the access once they submit? If the trip if the trip is closed out, if they so for instance if they um, let's say I want to so this yellow box is the indication of the trip that's currently active on my on my device um, and let me get, let me wait for these pixels to sort out um, but essentially what will happen here is um, there's an archive button right here so if the observer goes in and they hit archive it's going to basically say are you sure you want to close this trip. Because um, if you do so, you can no longer edit the data in this trip. Um, then, if I were to, if I were to select close trip, then they would not be able to do that. They could still access the data to look at it in their history here, but they could no longer make modifications, um, which is good for us as a staff because if a trip's finished, we don't want the observer monkeying around with their data. Um, if anything is going to get changed, it's going to get done on our end uh, in a debriefing process where we discuss with them what the changes are and make sure we record it and why and, and all that. So um, if they wanted to change, if they're in the trip and they haven't archived it and they do want to change a form, um, they could simply go to the form um, and then they could go down here and they could hit update. And once they're in this function, um, they could change whatever it is they need to change, and then we would get that notification. So um, let's say they made a mistake, the, they, they were clicking too fast, and it, it's actually, you know, the weather showers. Okay, submit. And now we have an update of that form. So I don't know. Andy, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Cool. 
and just just for the record, we also keep track of all these uh, later on modifications. So we would keep the original submission and we would send the updated version. But for uh, the observer records on shore, on the server, they would see that this data was edited later on, just in case they need to revisit it. Yeah, that's true. And in the very rare cases that are, there are multiple sets going on at the same time, uh, the application can handle that too. It's no problem. So they might be working on set two, but if they need to hop back into set one, they could, and they could still, you know, monkey around with whatever data they need to, to send at that point, and then they could just hop back into set two. Um, and then all the forms are sort of prefaced by the number of the set to also let them, to reinforce, hey, you're in this particular set. Josh, is there ever a case where you have to have the observer resend like a range of data for some reason? Something got botched up in the transmission or the dating mode process or something? And uh, you know, we, we, we run into that with our system sometimes where we have to get in touch with the observer and say, hey, resend halls eight through 12 or whatever. Oh yeah, um, you know, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, we're still early in testing. Um, I think what we're gonna have to do is uh, yeah, we'll have to look at the, the tests when they come back to see and just basically compare what's been ingested in our, our database management system with what's, uh, what's been sent on the tablet. But um, right now, we haven't seen anything like that where there's like this wholesale uh, mix up where they have to send like a real big batch of data. Um, I suspect if that were to be the case, we would probably just wait for the observer to return and pull the data, pull the files from the from the tablet. Um, but that's one of those programmatic things that we just haven't sorted out yet, I guess. That's a good question, though. Maybe I'll pick your brain on that later, Andy, to get some of these some of those uh, unforeseen risks that we haven't even thought about yet. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask a question about samples, like odorless or genetic samples from turtles. How do you um, cross-reference cross a number? Do you, does it spit out a number and then they attach that to the sample? Yep, totally. So, um, so what you guys are seeing is like one. <laughs> so the 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 platform, the electronic reporting platform that we're building in our program right now is actually a number of things. And this application is just kind of actually really one, it's a big piece, but it's, it's just one piece of it. The other piece is that database management system. So we've built, um, when these files get sent off, let's say I were in this pending tab and I took a sample of this bird or I kept it whole. And that's information I'm gonna record in this file. Um, there are numbers, um, there are bits and bytes and all sorts of things that are, are specific to this file that when we receive that data back here on this end, we know that, okay, the observer is, you know, it's from this catch record and this specimen's associated with this catch record, this photo is associated with this, this catch record and, and thus also associated with this specimen. Um, so all that's sort of tracked in, in our database management system. Um, the observer sort of knows just, just by virtue of, of their collection process and just by, you know, they can, they can look at their, their various summaries to see um, what's been caught and what they've taken samples of. Um, so, yeah, does that answer your question? So I get, I, we do track that, and there, we, have a lot of, um, we, la we have a lot of processes in place to make sure that, that data that is, that is connected to one another is, in fact, connected, and the end users can access all of it. Got it. So they put, they put a number in, let's say, the bag with the albatross. Oh, I see. Yeah, no, I, I guess I'm just trying to say, once you get that specimen and it comes back, you know, are, are, are they spitting out a number and putting it on that specimen? Yeah, we have a specimen log, a logging protocol. Um, what's cool about the tablet is the tablet will actually generate that number for the observer, so they don't even have to, um, they don't have to, to, to do some sort of, um, they don't have to figure out that number on their own or like put it, plug it into some sort of formula like they have historically, some sort of like data collection kabuki or whatever. Like basically the application will say, okay, this is your, this is this record, this is your specimen number, record this. So um, it augment, so yes, uh, it just augments the process. So it does do that, but it, it simply augments it.
hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Cool. Hey, this is uh, Brett Alger. I have a question. So I know up in the Northeast, um, like our BMS program, when we do software changes, they have the uh, units in the office and they can sort of uh, do testing um, in the office you know, environment rather than out on vessels. So in this particular case, help me kind of figure out, uh, like, are you guys able to do like beta testing within the office or is there a component of this? I mean, clearly there's a component that needs to happen at sea, but are you guys able to do sort of simulation testing within the office? Because it seems like you're trip limited. Yeah, so it is a little limited in the office. The, the process we've been going about doing this is basically we, we sort of do a, we spend a week or maybe a little bit longer um, with the development team really drawing up this particular phase's specifications and requirements. Um, and we do this based on the previous phase's feedback. Once we sort of have this, this whiteboard of, of, of specifications and requirements and how we want to, to, to design our application, we kind of go through this process of um, the developers will, will build out some modules. Um, we in the office will then test those modules and provide feedback. And then we kind of do this like iterative, agile, um, uh, you know, development, test, development, test, development, test. And then once we sort of check off the boxes, um, and there are literal boxes that we're checking off to make sure that it's beta ready. So once it's like more or less feature complete and the, the bugs are at a minimal, um, yeah, like there's, there's less crashes, the bugs aren't too bad, things like that. That's when we, we give it to the observers and say, okay, take this out to sea and go ahead and, and give us a, a more robust test. Um, but yeah, Brett, to answer your question, like yeah, we're we're doing quite a bit of testing in office to make sure this stuff works before we hand it out to the observers. And in fact, there's there's a bit of a um, it's a bit of a challenge too because you want to give this to the observers to get the most meaningful feedback that you can to make the best changes for the usability and the usefulness of the application. But at the same time, you don't want to give them something that doesn't work because you'll lose buy-in really early on, and you want advocates in your early beta testers to want to make the product better as opposed to just, you know, get it out there and then something breaks and then they're frustrated. Uh, so there's a, there's a bit of a, a line you walk in terms of like how ready is the application for the observers, which observers are you choosing, um, and things like that. And so we have a series of checklists, uh, it's just called the beta readiness checklist. I can share it with you guys if you want to see it. But basically we go through and we check different boxes. Is the, is the application ready? XYZ, is the team ready XYZ, and are the users ready XYZ? And once all those boxes are checked, then we, we move into beta testing. Um, I don't know. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, Brett. Yeah, it did. Thank you. Uh, let me just add something in there. I mean, just for, for the record, I, I don't know if you plan on addressing a little bit about the hardware by itself, Josh, but so what the observers on the boat they have is like an all-in-one tablet with an embedded Iridium model. So they have like a one device, which is like 10 inch uh, wide, where they can input the data and it's transmitted directly from this one piece of device. Uh, what Josh has on his team at the office is regular Android tablets, but they also have one of our VMS units, which is able to transmit data. So while at the office, they can directly send data from from his desk, uh, just being inside if he connects to this uh, uh, satellite antenna, which is uh, mounted on the building. Uh, and I think he's putting up the, a little bit. So yeah, you can see here an image of what the device looks like. And so that's what the observer on the boat have. And we did some tests too uh, with Josh on that uh, when he was out in <coughs> his building, but he can also in real time do some testing from his office. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I can, all I have to do if I want to get, get a pretty accurate test of the entire pipeline, so from the device through the satellite, you know, encryption through the satellites to the CLSA processing center um, into our database management system and decrypted for us to see, all I simply have to do is walk outside on the patio and eat my lunch and do that. Like, it's pretty, pretty easy for us in the office to do this, so it's really not that challenging. Um, yeah. In terms of checking the whole system, it's not that challenging. Hey, Josh, this is Glenn Campbell in Seattle with Andy. I got a couple questions about this, the, the satellite transmission. So basically, 
You're not you're the system your satellite system you're using is independent of the vessel, right? You're not dependent upon right. the vessel's communications, right? We're not, and that was a discussion we had early on back in uh, probably 2015, maybe even 2014. We were discussing that. I mean, there was not there was uh, a potential that the observers could take a tablet and they could simply Bluetooth into the vessel's VMS system and connect the satellites that way. Um, and I know that in some regions that's how the observers operate. They essentially use the equipment on the vessel, and that's how they connect. In our fishery, because of the some of the challenges we have, um, economy of scale and whatnot. I mean, it's a relatively, it's a relatively um, uh, small fishery in that sense. There's just not a lot of technology on these vessels. Uh, it was important that the observers had their own standalone unit that regardless of what the vessel had, the observers could connect the satellites. So, so, so that's, so one that's all why built into the tablet then? And it's all built into the tablet, yeah. Okay, all they so ha have you estimated what your transmission costs are that are, are going to be occur to the agency? We have estimated it. Um, we're re-estimating it right now based on some of the encryption uh, stuff that we've added because the encryption sort of uh, kind of tweaks those things. Um, because, we did yeah. some, yeah. Because cost is so, obviously a big factor. Not only do you have cost of the physical product, but the, your agency is going to be actually occurring the cost of transmission versus putting that off on the vessel. That's something people have to understand as well. Oh yeah, totally. And no, we uh, transmission we costs, especially what you're dealing with, you're probably paying per byte. My, would be my guess. We are, and Matthew can probably explain a little further. We we did the early testing, and we um, we sort of figured, okay, an average size trip is this much bits and bytes. The minimum is this much bits and bytes, and the maximum is this much bits and bytes. Right. So we did all these calculations of, you know, finding the range and kind of sort of sorting out like what we can expect, and then we sort of took that information to the contractor, CLS America, and said, okay, these are our needs. These are how many trips we have in a year. This is the average size trip. It could be as much as this. It could be as little as this. We need a data package deal that essentially fits our needs, and it makes this economic for us. And they, in, in, in this next phase of testing, they really came to the table and, and helped us out with that. Um, and so that's that's kind of how we're we're going through this. We'll know more to once we start uh, looking at encryption. But yeah, I I don't think it's going to be too much of a challenge. Uh, the cost of this stuff. We're also doing some cost estimates, trying to compare the current data collection process um, with all our iterative DQ um, uh, checks that we do to see if we're actually saving money in the long run. Yeah, um, but you, and I, you're going to find this, we find this in Alaska, once you go down the road of electronic reporting, I'm not talking about recording, electronic reporting, people are going to want more and more types of data. So that's <laughs> yeah. you, a good thing, but you've kind of opened a can of worms too, but that's just the reality of it. That's um, not lost on me. That's kept me up at night. A few, yeah, the, a few the other question I have is about the data itself. Are you still going to require, do you still require observers to put the data on paper in the event that something happens or somehow you can validate what they typed in was correct? No. So in, um, in production, the idea right now, the hypothesis I'll say, is that the observer takes this, this is their primary means of recording um, data, and if it were to fail, uh, they would resort back to some sort of paper uh, data collection you know, backup. Um, we've even talked about giving them two tablets, uh, although there's some weird, um, some things you'd have to work out there. But the idea in production is that they would just be recording on this, and we'd be getting, ra getting away from paper entirely. So um, how, how do you reconcile then, because most of what happens with electronic reporting, most of your data errors occur with data key punch errors or data entry errors. So yeah, how do you totally ask an observer a question that something re happened a month ago or two months ago if you don't have any reference to a paper form if that value's right or not? Yeah, well, for us, we can actually ask them in real time. So if we're getting data back, you know, within a day, we can look at, we can review the data, and if something looks uh, irregular, we can actually just, we can talk to that observer um, in, in real time if we need to. That said, um, based on most of the literature out there and the, and the research that we've done, the, we're designing this application in a way that sort of um, mitigates user errors. So using drop-down boxes and different dynamic behaviors and, and sort of pop-up um, windows and things like that. The, the idea is that 
Right now in the current data collection process, the observer records data on paper, they make mistakes on paper, yeah. and then the QA, QC process happens in office in the debriefing process. So, in so, this scenario, okay. the idea is the observer um, records data, the QA actually happens on the front end in front of the user on the tablet, and the QC happens in real time with the debriefer. And so the tablet's going to do a much better job of QA, and the database management system is going to do a much better job of QC, and then at the end of the day, um, we're going to get a better product out of that, and there will be no need to reconcile. There will still be mistakes, but there will be, in my, in my hypothesis, there will be far less mistakes. Um, and I'm, I'm basically pulling from a lot of the literature that knows published on this topic, uh, a lot of the stuff that FIS has published and whatnot in terms of uh, what makes, what, what is good data quality, how you define data quality, what that looks like. Um, so that's, that's what we're, that's, well, that's my story and I'm sticking to it, let's put it that way. <laughs> Josh, this is uh, Jim Finnegan in the Northeast. Just to clarify, your, uh, the data transmission <clears throat> excuse me, uh, excludes or, or uh, doesn't include any of the media, correct? The actual photo data, for example? Correct, yeah. I think if we've talked about it, and there may be occasions where maybe we would want to do that. Uh, maybe if, if you know, the fishery's uh, going to be closed or something because of like a false killer whale interaction or I don't know. Uh, there are a number of scenarios where maybe the – the, the debriefers want to see that data as soon as possible. Um, but right now, uh, essentially in the debriefing process, they would come in, they would, they would hook their tablet up to the mothership, and we would just get, we would access all that, all that media. Um, yeah, that's kind of, that's the approach we're taking right now. Okay, so, so the data transmission itself is measured in, for a whole trip, is measured in dozens of kilobytes and not megabytes or larger, correct? Yeah, um, actually, yeah. let me see if I can find the, um, I'll just, if I can briefly pull this up. Uh, where's my drive? Let's see here. Um, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not totally heinous, uh, the number of bytes. Um, yeah, well, iridium, I mean, <laughs> if you were transmitting photos, you'd have to wait an awful long time. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, totally. It's, <laughs> Everyone, the headquarters folks have to sign off our conference is being taken over. I'm sorry, I missed that. What was that, Danny? I think he said he was signing off. Uh, yeah, I think, I think headquarters get off the line. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can't seem to find the. I think this is the one we haven't sold out yet, but there's. I think this will at least show you the bits and bytes. Yeah, okay. So um, these are the different electronic forms that we have, and then the average number of records that an observer will send over the course of a trip. So you can see like one line of catch. An observer will send about 626 over the course of a trip, um, and then the average size uh, in terms of the package um, and whatnot. So, you know, and then over here you see average total size per byte for the trip for these particular forms. Um, and then we probably will we'll total this up. We this is a new this is a new spreadsheet. We're going to add the encryption in. We haven't done that yet, but um, we are making those calculations. So. All right, thanks everyone. I'm going to um, cut this off now. Um, apologize if folks still have more questions.